This is Sunshine Cathedral perspective. Our queer crystal ball predictions what religion look, looks like in America in 2044. The new year has begun and it is a perfect time to take that magical crystal ball out of from the old trunk once again and find out what the future holds for religious faith, LGBTQ plus community and young generations. But in our conversation, let's not look at 2024, but rather the next 20 years of religion and what we might expect by 2044. If you ask about the future of religion in the, in the world building chat room on Reddit, <clears throat> religions such as Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, and Buddhism still exist, although the number of religious people might fall dramatically. If you ask Pew Research, it stays something similar. Depending on whether religious switching continues at recent rates, speed up, or stop entirely, the report says Christian faith representation could drop by more than 20 points by 35 to 35% by 2070. As far as the religious queer population is concerned, Pew conducted research showing LGBTQ plus adults are less religious than the general public. About half, 48%, have no religious affiliation, compared with 20% in the general public. Also, a third, 33% of religiously affiliated LGBTQ plus adults say there is a conflict between their religious belief and their sexual orientation or gender identity. Researchers predict that those numbers would dramatically increase in the next two decades. And most important, of, and most important of all, the queer crystal ball looks at Gen Alpha coming after Gen Z culture. Experts predict it will be the most liberal, technologically embracing, climate-driven, sexual identity fluid population <laughs> in history. Gen Alpha will be the first antithesis to baby boomers. As the sexes show, church-going numbers are overwhelmingly dominated by baby boomers. As we can clearly see in our queer crystal ball that the future is going to be in favor of a younger population with more inclusive and open values. So the real question is, will the church as an organization survive? Mm. So this is interesting because this is actually what um, my dissertation is focused on, mm. which is how to how to create authentic ministry with the religious nuns. Mm. Now, the nuns is not mm. the nuns with you know the Catholic nuns, <laughs> but it's the N O N E S. Mm -hmm. um, that is, and actually, the, the Pew Research calls these um, people the people who are still they still want to retain a faith, but they're not they don't find a home anymore in the traditional mm -hmm. spaces for faith. Right and. You know, my, my experience with working with this population, like no reservations, we, we mainly focus on this population. It's the it's just people have just come through our, our you know, our, our, our doors and um, have created this community where it's neither, you know, gay, straight, you know, um, and any any identity that you can think of we are n we're none of it but we're all of it mm -hmm. and we create a community that is that is that is encompassing of all and in that yes there is immense tension mm -hmm. but there's yeah. also beauty in that tension mm -hmm. and i feel like the future of the church is it's like like the story says it's it's very complicated because numbers are kind of continuing to go down because the church as it is today the institution that is the church is crumbling from the inside out but it's not just the church that is crumbling. Our, at the, at the academy is crumbling. Mm -hmm. Our social mm -hmm. structures are crumbling. Wow. Our yeah. politics are crumbling. Yes. Mm -hmm. Across the board, all of these <clears throat> pillars of our societies are crumbling and they're showing that their foundations were never strong enough to withstand the um, diversity that is coming out of younger generations. Mm. So it's, 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 it's going to be a very complicated future. But again, I, I feel that this future opens up such a a beauty for um uh innovation when it comes to what the church would look like what the mm. church 4.0 or 3.0 mm. or whatever mm -hmm. point oh will look like when it comes to millennials gen z and the alpha generation mm. and that's that's awesome yeah. yeah i the the church the movement the concept the the body of christ the you know yeah that's probably here to stay yeah it is uh will the vatican always be held in high regard will the salt lake city temple always be held in high regard i don't know <laughs> uh and only so much a little bit care uh it, things evolve or they go extinct right and so yeah what it looks like in 20 years it already doesn't look like it looked 20 years ago 
True. And it's trying to make, it's trying to relive, it's always trying to get there to have a better past or get back to the past or relive the past that kills things. And um, so a lot of churches that they've just, they've held on to tradition at all costs have become really beautiful museums where you can go and learn about the history. Uh, mm -hmm. But they don't have anything new going on. They don't have anything mm -hmm. for today. They don't have anything for people, what they're looking for today. And so you can go and, and find a lot, of, a lot of interesting history and a lot of beautiful artwork. And there's a place for that. But that's not a dynamic movement. Right. That mm -hmm. would, so I think the movement will always exist. And it will never look like it used to look. I think that's the story of Pentecost. Uh, something's new going on. Now, if we try to make it look like the day of Pentecost, that's going back, and that, <laughs> we didn't learn our Pentecost lesson. Huh. But in Pentecost, something new is happening, and, we, and we're going to go out and, and be renewed and do things in new ways. And uh, the Book of Acts says, and the Spirit added to their numbers daily. Mm -hmm. uh, because, because new is exciting. New is exciting. Mm -hmm. So I think, and I'm going to do something I've never done. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to give our game plan. Usually we're talking, I assume, mostly to unchurched people or mm -hmm. to people who are mad at church or whatever. Um, but I, if there's church people and, and pastors and, and seminaries, watch seminaries, I'm, I'm going to give you a little crystal ball moment. A little crystal ball moment. Mm -hmm. There you go. We have looked into the future and we have tried to adapt to it. And uh, so we are challenged because our marketing people market us as the, lar as the world's largest progressive queer church. Uh, I think it's pretty much true because there aren't many progressive queer churches anyway. There are, there are open and affirming churches but they're sort of traditional with their theology. Or there there are really progressive churches, but they certainly don't identify as queer. They, they may like gay people, but they don't identify as queer. We use queer theology as our lens and queer hermeneutics as our lens. So even if we had all straight people, we'd be a queer church because that's the lens we use. That's how we identify. That's that's our scholarship and that's our spirituality. So we that we identify as both progressive and queer makes us very different and that we are also sizable. But it's not just that. When people say, oh yeah, but this church is gay-friendly and they've got this many members and you only have this many members. They are judging by 1950s church. <laughs> and we're talking about 21st century church going into mid to late 21st century church. Mm -hmm. And we're already trying to be there. So yes, we have, uh, before pandemic, we'd have four or 500 people on a Sunday. Now we have three, 320, 330 on a Sunday. That's less than we even had. And yes, there are people who have more on a Sunday. But we're here seven days a week. We have up to 10,000 people a week on the campus. We have more than 30,000 people a week. In fact, uh, is it 4 million that it was uh, uh, for the year? Um, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, 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 online engagements, uh, most of that being people watching our streaming programming. And so, yeah, when we have, when we have 4 million a year who do this and 40,000 people we serve a, a year uh, in the food program and 10,000 people a week on our campus for this, that, or the other thing. And so, yes, our church is big and worship on Sunday is one of the things we do and has become not even the biggest thing we do. Mm -hmm. But this church, this church isn't a Sunday morning in a room experience. And that doesn't even count uh, the places we go out to. Uh, Reverend Kevin has two or three uh, assisted living so that he takes services to. And so, yes, how we do church isn't how they did church in the 50s. But how we do church now has made us, we thrived in COVID. We, we, uh, we didn't miss a Sunday. There were Sundays you couldn't get in, but we still had church. Amen. We had zero in the room and, and tens of thousands of people participating. And so, uh, now I'm not saying that's how it's going to look in 2044, but I'm saying if we try to make it look like it looked in 1964, you're going to have buffus. Yep. <laughs> uh, so if you think out of the box, try to do what is relevant and needed today. And then when that changes, change with it. Oh yeah, there's all, we're always going to have a thing. We're always going to have a thing. It will not look like it looked before. And if we insist that it does, then it will not serve very many people. Right. I just realized that I am a baby boomer in a Gen Alpha church. It is phenomenal to be able to see things from my perspective and then look at what this church is doing. I, I, you remember when the earth cooled I'm, and now you're part I'm, of trying you're, to fight global warming. You're just a bad boy <laughs> and you can't help yourself. But I, I, as you say, I work with um, two assisted living facilities and um, a, a, a residence where most of the residents there are LGBTQ um, affirming at least. but. I worked with a SunServe youth group for a while, and I'm sorry I'm not with them right now, but one of the kids used to every week come up to me and say, last week I thought I was this, and this week I'm feeling something different. I love that, the, that our youth are able to feel 
themselves, to understand what gender fluidity actually means, to be able to say, well, last week I, I was he, him, they, them, and this week I'm he, uh, she, he. You know, I'm whatever I want to be, and I am comfortable enough to be able to say it out loud. And I think that a church like ours, a church like yours, an organization like ours, let people realize that they're not alone, that they can do things that they've never thought to do before. Well, safe schools is one of the, like, they're the heroes in our community. I, there you go. Yeah. No, honestly. <laughs> yes. No, I mean, they've, no, we need them so much. So, And that's another thing. Parachurch organizations. I mean, Volunteers of America is actually a denomination. Mm -hmm. They... But they only have a few churches, really. They, but they'll have chapels at their at their social service sites. Like Volunteers of America is a whole different way of, of being church. I mean, there's just if you if you if you think it has to look like it used to look, it may not look that way, and it may not be very effective. But if you can be Volunteers of America, mm -hmm. if you if you can be Safe Schools, if you can if you can be this weird thing that we've got going on, where we we have almost forty performances in our in our performing arts series. We we are we are a major performing arts venue. Uh, we call that church. We think we're doing church. We think we're doing a good yeah, thing in the yes, world. We are. And, uh, you know, and, but there won't be an invocation or a hymn. But right. we've got people coming together. Because for us, it's not about dogma. It's not, it's not about creeds. It's not about uh, church history. It's about community. It's about love. It's about kindness. It's about compassion. Uh, in fact, we say that kindness is our worship and compassion is our prayer. And so, and you can do that in as many ways as you can imagine. Yeah. And, and there are people that don't really understand the whole point of innovation especially when it comes to the virtual spaces that exist now, that not a lot of progressive organizations are taking advantage of it. Uh, conservative organizations are taking full advantage oh, of it. Yeah. Progressive organizations are not. So it's beautiful that Central Cathedral is really taking advantage of that space. And for us at Safe Schools, mm -hmm. one, of the, one, one of the main reasons that I came in was for us to tap into that space. Mm -hmm. at, you know, when, when we were still allowed to have kids at events, when, you know, before the government decided that that's not cool anymore, we had maybe 300 400 kids at any given event that we did now we don't have now we don't have any in person uh, events because we're not allowed to mm -hmm. but we have over 30,000 kids watching our programs watching us online mm -hmm. watching the, the you know the, the educational component mm -hmm. that we re that we you know providing to them that is giving them a different queer perspective yes. on the things that they are feeling and the mm -hmm. things that they are going through. And we're, and we're gearing up to also release this for teachers, release it for students, creating a virtual environment that where the government says no, we say yes. Because yeah, yeah, you, yeah, you yeah, can yeah. Kind of take, kind of take a lot for you to come and <laughs> shut us down. And you can yeah. try and then, you know, let, let's, let's see what that happens if that happens. But, um, but that's, that's the whole thing about Safe Schools. Safe Schools decided to innovate mm -hmm. and go virtual and take it to where the kids are at. The kids are in school, yes, but the kids go to Discord, the kids go on YouTube, yep. the kids mm -hmm. are yes. in these yes. spaces more yes. than they are sitting in a classroom. Exactly. Yes. And that's where we wanna be. That's where we have to be in order to provide good education for our queer youth. And mm -hmm. sometimes leadership is is having an idea and pitching it and seeing if people, you know, agree, you know, will mm -hmm. buy it and follow it. And sometimes leadership is finding what's going on and running to get ahead. Yes, of it. yeah. That's and the, that's where this is. They're already <laughs> meeting on Reddit. Yep. They're already mm -hmm. meeting on Facebook. They're already meeting on Snapchat, which I've never understood. I just, it goes away and it's not there, and then you can make a little face. I don't know. But they're in all these places <laughs> that are too smart for me, even. So it's not a matter of we need to think of how to do it. We just need to get in there. It's already happening. Yeah. Yep. We just need to let our voices be part of it. They've already formed their what I would call churches. Yeah. Because yeah. ecclesia, it, it means gathering, it means assembly. They're already assembling in virtual spaces. Uh, so what they need is for us to come and add our voices because they're doing it without us. So yeah. we may as well just get in there because it's already happening. And one of the challenges that we have faced is that when it comes to funding, like some funders don't understand that the metrics are different. Mm -hmm. we, we can't give metrics anymore of like, you know, in-person events because we don't have in-person because we're not allowed to have in-person mm -hmm. events like we used to. So they're still asking us for like metrics that just don't exist. So then when we say like, but we can, you know, we have X amount of people who are viewing us. We have mm -hmm. X amount of minutes mm -hmm. that are being consumed. That is captured. But they don't they, they don't see it that way. Mm. So, you know, if there's a challenge that I that I want to point out, put out there to people who are watching us is to inspire funders to change the metrics, yeah. to look at what virtual looks like, mm -hmm. to look at how they can support virtual programs yeah. that are ha that have, if not the same, even more impact on the amount of people that are consuming mm -hmm. the information. 
So, you They're know, looking to fund 1988 churches, 1988 churches, in 2024, yes. and it's already it's already uh, uh, an endangered species. <laughs> it will be extinct in 2044. Yes. So they need to look that virtual isn't fake, mm -hmm. <laughs> that we are capturing this information. They are engaging uh, without our without our online stuff. Uh, we wouldn't make budget. They are fully engaged They're They're every time we're offering anything, they they contribute. Uh, they try to volunteer from where they are, and then when they're here, they, they roll their sleeves in and they person. pitch in here. Yep. It's it is a real thing, and uh, and don't let someone who's who's trying to live in the past tell you how to create your future. Uh, they may not make it easy for you, but don't let them define it for you because you know what you're doing and you know where you're going, yep. and they're going to learn eventually. So all this to say, the church is dead. Long live the church. Yeah, there you go. I think, I think <laughs> something will be here for sure. <laughs> you're a church planter. Yes, You've you planted are. churches. Yeah. Been there, done that. A movement in, in, in the Caribbean, a church in the uh, uh, in, in Western hills. Maryland. <laughs> uh, you, you ran chapels all over the world with the military. You're like our Paul. What about it? You are Paul. So what, Crystal what Ball has spoken. And, <laughs> and, and have been super integral in our online uh, expansion. Well, here's the thing. I mean, to answer the question, will, will the church and organization survive? The answer is yes. But what will it survive looking like? Right. And if we don't have creative people, innovative people sitting around talking, that really thinking outside of the, the brick, bricks and mortars, it's not going to happen for some places. If one thing COVID has taught, and there's many lessons still coming out of COVID around mm -hmm. the church world and religious world, is that COVID taught us how to be uh, the church alive. Mm -hmm. It taught us how to be the church present. It taught us how to be the church future. And it, it really taught us about what is really important in church culture. Uh, and a lot of the stuff that we thought was important in church culture really isn't. You know, uh, you know the choir need to protest down the aisle. Uh, you need a whole crucifix, everything protest. Yeah, you know, are those things really important? Yes, they're nice. They're they're pretty. They're attractive. But when you come down to it, somebody needs to be fed. Mm -hmm. Somebody needs to be housed. Someone needs a job. And there's all the uh, the isms out there that needs to be addressed. So yes, the church is going to survive. We just have to be able to articulate what that's going to look like. Not for us who are here. Maybe a little bit for those who are yet to come, but even beyond that. Right. Yeah. And we have to be able to release it. Mm. Right. Yeah. We cannot become victims of our own success and all this stuff. Yeah. We got to let it go because somebody, you know, this is 2024, 10 years from now, somebody's going to be doing a new thing. And we'll say, you know what? Let's go with it. Right. You know, and just, just be able to, you know, almost that fluid to a degree. Mm -hmm. Uh, and making sure, you know, I, I think uh, as someone said, you know, you, you're moving more to the elder road now. It's like, I'm not that old, but <laughs> <laughs> it's like you move more to the elder road now where, you know, you know, the wisdom becomes more important than the practicum of it because we need people who have wisdom in this, who's done it, who's led it to say, these are the things you may want to think about. Right. So you become the think present for a lot of these organizations. So it's going to survive. Let's get with it. Yeah. I'm waiting for the flip out phone and say, Scotty, beam me up. So, you know. <laughs> Ooh, gee, I remember the landline um, rotary dial phones, and now I'm trying to talk to Scotty, beam me up. There you go. Good let's, luck to well, us all. Do you remember your first phone call with a blanket over fire? Um, <laughs> no, it was Watson, I need you. <laughs> Next up, we're excited to tell you about our next adventure with our Global Fellowship. In 2024, we'll be going to where the hills are live as we explore Austria and Alpine Europe for Gay Oktoberfest. Space is extremely <laughs> limited, so make sure to go to happeningout.travel sunshine to reserve your space now.